Okay, now, uh, you know, it's really a great pleasure to have Francesco here. We have been working together for many, many years, and it's been extremely productive and pleasurable, and I think he's really a big innovator in the area of educational robotics, of robots uh, in daily life. So just for the logistics, I will be, I will be uh, moderating uh, Francesco's lectures, and after that I have to go to a talk at a conference and then I will pass the floor to Fabio Bonsignorio, who is the host here in Madrid, and he will moderate the Robert Riner's lecture, just uh, for the logistics. Okay, now Great. we're very much looking forward to Francesco's lecture. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So I have uh, 30 minutes, is that right, uh, Rolf? If you can do about 25 minutes so that we have 20, okay. uh, five minutes we'll for questions. To, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, great, thanks. Okay, so thank you for, uh, for the invitation and thank you for the introduction. So uh, I will start a little bit with the, with the motivation. Uh, so uh, Nathan, if you can start the, the, uh, the, the video, the first video, which is a, which is a nice video, and uh, not this one, the other one. Uh, there is one before. Uh, this one. Okay. Uh, so this is this is a very funny video uh, where uh, people imagine how robots could uh, enter into our daily life, if you if you if you want. So uh, I think that, like me, everybody. I hope everybody <laughs> uh, attending these talks believes that uh, robots will, will massively enter in our life. Perhaps not in that uh, in that way, like in the in the in the video, but but in another way. We don't know exactly how, and this is the main question. So, how uh, robots will really enter into daily life? And uh, in Europe, the European Commission made this year uh, uh, a survey asking to people, uh, among other questions, uh, where you would think that robots should be banned. So. And, and the, the result is a little bit scary on one, uh, there, is, there is one answer which is a little bit scary is that 60% of the people answer that robots should be banned from care of children, elderly and the disabled and 34% uh, said robots should be banned from education. So uh, uh, that's uh, a little bit uh, shocking because this is exactly the field where I like to work and many people like to work or we would like to, to introduce uh, service robots. And I think that uh, these answers come from, uh, from a vision of robots that people have and this is the type of, of vision they have. Uh, they imagine robots uh, like what we see in industries, so the, the, the big uh, manipulators or big robots into the, the home, either humanoid or uh, with, a, with, a, with a shape. But those robots are a little bit, they, they come with ants, they, they are not well, well integrated into the, into the home. And uh, in, 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 if this is the image, I can understand that people don't want to give their child uh, in the hand of, of, of this type of robots. So what should we do? Uh, we, could do we could stop making research because in Switzerland with 60% 60, 60 of the people uh, against you, you can vote, and then you get get a law that uh, is forbidding you to do research. Okay, uh, but uh, I don't think this is the this is a real situation. Uh, should we wait that people better accept the robots? Should we force them economically? As soon as there are too many elderly people, then uh, we will need probably a new solution, and robot could be one. Or should we wait a robotic iPod, or iPhone that will uh, make everybody enthusiastic. I think that none of those is my answer to, the, to this question. Uh, I prefer to, to construct something and uh, I will present you two possible ways on which I'm, I'm studying now to, to answer this, this, uh, this question of the acceptance of robotics in daily life by uh, the large public. So one uh, direction I'm working on is reshaping robotics in such a way that they, are, they better fit the, the existing ecosystem, the ecosystem of the home. Uh, 
Theom is not only uh, some people uh, that buy the robots. The home is a full ecosystem where you have uh, the furniture, the walls, people, some uh, way of living in that, in that home. And this ecosystem is a stable uh, system where you cannot introduce uh, new technology as you want. You need to be very careful and uh, people will not accept anything, okay? Uh, every, everything that you, that you want to, to accept. So we have to perhaps reshape robotics in such a way that is better accepted into this ecosystem. And on the other side, it could be interesting to educate people to better understand robotics. So in, in some way, reshape a little bit uh, the people. So I will start with this second point, so the, the, the education. Uh, the education is important, and in this survey by the European Commission, there was an interesting result that uh, people who already had a robot at home or at work were more positive toward uh, robots. Even uh, manual workers, who normally are a little bit uh, fearing to, to lose their job, manual workers who already had a contact with the robots uh, tend to be more positive and don't believe so much about the fact that the robot can steal their jobs. So as soon as you get in contact with the robot, you are more positive toward robotics. And this aspect of education is very interesting for us to improve acceptance of, uh, of robots in daily life. Of course, there are plenty of robots now used for education. The, robot, the Lego Mindstorm is a good example. Uh, this type of kit are, very, uh, are great. Uh, but uh, there are several small aspects. For instance, most of those kits are very technical and, uh, and they are oriented in the, in the way they, they are presented to, to, to boys. Uh, we don't know exactly how, uh, what, what's the real impact of this, of this kit. There is no real assessment. Uh, they are still not very welcome in schools because uh, teachers are quite reluctant to these new technologies and and sometimes they are too expensive to be, to be acquired by a school. So what we wanted to, to, to develop here in Lausanne was uh, a robot that is uh, cheap, that is gender and age neutral, uh, is flexible, and, and try to solve some of the problems that, that, the, that the existing uh, system have. So we came with this uh, robot, which is the, the, the Timio. I have one here. Uh, is, a, is a small robot which is uh, cheap, is open hardware, so you can have all the, uh, the schematics, all the software, etc. We have shown that it's gender neutral, so uh, boy, and, boy and girls uh, appreciate it uh, uh, at the same level. Uh, it can be program, programmed, it is flexible. And to show you a, a little bit the type of flexibility, uh, there is a short video uh, Nathan, if you can uh, broadcast it, so that it gives you a little bit the idea of uh, of the of the functionality of the robot. Okay, so this gives you a little bit the, 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 the global picture of the robot is a robot where we use a lot the, the, the interactivity, we use a lot the colors. Uh, we can do with this robot plenty of, of, uh, of activities, either with the robot alone or with the robot 
combined uh, with uh, either Lego construction kits or other way of, of building a, a kind of construction around it. Uh, but there is one key uh, issue uh, I would like to, to speak about, and there are, there are, plenty, uh, are plenty of features, but I will speak about one uh, specific uh, feature, is about the use of the embodiment to improve the explanation. Uh, following the courses of, of Rolf, you, you, you need to, I think that you all understand the role of embodiment and uh, I think that the embodiment right. can be used Very important. to <laughs> yes can be used to uh, improve understanding. I will make you uh, a small uh, a small example uh, with uh, uh, this uh, this small system. So. Uh, if you want to understand that most of, most of our system now, uh, they have uh, inputs, they have outputs. Normally, the input is connected to a, a system that, that digitalizes the input. Then it enters into a computer, and then there is a digital output, and then there is a motor, and then the motors do something. Okay? So uh, you have a, a, an input here, and you have an output uh, uh, in, on the bottom. Okay? Uh, if I show you this system and I ask you to understand how the input is related to the output, then uh, I don't know if all of you can understand what's the relationship. Is that linear? Is dependent on the speed that I'm activating it or not? It's very hard to understand. So uh, to understand this, you, you need to either open this or uh, put measurements here and here and, and try to do a graph and then try to understand from the graph what's going on. Okay? This, is not, this is not trivial and takes time. If I show you this, okay, I think that everybody understands what's going on. You don't need much explanation. In a few seconds you understand many of the characteristics of the system. Uh, and, and this is the way perhaps technology was done uh, uh, some, uh, some years ago so technology was a little bit more uh, visible and people could understand a little bit better the, the technology now technology is a little bit more hidden and we have much more difficulty to understand what's going on so the idea with the, with the Timio was to play with the, with the colors and with the lights which doesn't cost anything anymore, and to try to, uh, to visualize some, some phenomena. So I will try to, to show you uh, one example uh, using Timio and the visualization using the embodiment to understand what's going on. So here I have the, the Timio, and I will uh, put it in, in, a, in a mode of exploration. And uh, here you will see the robot moving forward, and the robot stops at the end of the table. Why the robot is stopping there? Okay. Uh, so there are plenty of ways to detect the, the edge of the table, but if, we, if I show you a little bit more in detail, you see that there are two red dots here, and when the red dots are on, the wheels are, are moving. If I if I move the robots like this, then the red dots are not are off now, and the wheels are off. So as soon as I put it on the table, the red dots come on, and the wheel is moving. So there is a clear relationship with the two, and in fact, when they're at the edge of the table, you can immediately see that the sensor are not seeing the, the, the table anymore. These are the two sensor here. And uh, these two sensors are, in fact, in charge of detecting the, the edge of the table. By doing this, you can explain to, the, to a child uh, the, 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 the phenomenon of, of, of detecting the edge of the table in a couple of seconds. And you don't need to uh, switch on a computer or connect to a computer and then start explaining a program or a behavior in a, in a different way. So this is a, just a small example. but. It's just to show you that by, by a correct embodiment, you can improve explanation 
in a, in a, in a radical way, and we try to push this, this as far as possible. Uh, also, the level of the, the different sensors, so we visualize all the sensors, we visualize uh, uh, some of the, of the behaviors using colors, etc. So, try to think about embodiment in also a way to make the, the behavior of the robot transparent. And this is not only important for education, but could be also important, we will see an example in robotics for, uh, for daily life. Uh, I will now move, try to be a little bit, uh, go a little bit faster to, through, through this. We were thinking also to reshaping robots uh, for, for daily life in order to, to, to improve acceptance. And the idea was also here to exploit the embodiment and we wanted to, we want to go uh, to an embodiment in everybody object. So instead of having a, a robot coming inside the, the ecosystem uh, from scratch, uh, we would like to put robotics into everyday objects, objects that are already into the ecosystem, like a, a table, like a chair, like a, whatever is already in the, in the home. So uh, by taking advantage of this type of embodiment, uh, we can enter more smoothly in the ecosystem, we can distribute robotics into the ecosystem, we can have a natural interaction with the, with the user because the user is already used to, to work with these objects. And then by, by doing this, try to, to get a, a better acceptance. So I will try to, to show you that we went through several studies. Uh, one study on the, on the vacuum cleaners, which is in fact an object of, the, of, of daily life, where robotics is already entering now, and then uh, try to project this type of approach to the future, and uh, we try to found, uh, find a, an application, and the application we found was tidying up the room of the children, the children room. This is a horrible task that everybody tried to avoid because it's a nightmare. Uh, we tried to solve it with our approach of objects, robotic objects, by creating a robotic storage box. So a box which can interact with the, with the children to motivate them to tidy up the room instead of having a robot that makes it itself the job. We have a robot that interacts with the children and help them or motivate them uh, to, to tidy up the room by, by having lights and sound, etc. And then uh, we will probably have several of them. This is the next step of our project. Uh, toward uh, a room which is totally uh, robotized, we'll have uh, many robots. I will just say a few words about the study we made on the, on the Roomba. So we wanted to understand what is the impact of uh, putting a Roomba, uh, a Roomba into, a, into a, a family from the user perspective or from the technical perspective. And uh, therefore we made two parallel studies, one uh, with the uh, household uh, having a Roomba uh, and studied during six, six months. And from the other side, we, we studied six existing vacuum cleaner and their technology, how they made, how they perform, etc. And there are plenty of results, but I will just mention two of them, which are, in my opinion, very interesting because they mix the user need and the technical uh, uh, performance. The first one is quite uh, trivial. Uh, we saw that all the, all the people were quite concerned about energy consumption and uh, the technology which is now entering into this type of machine, which is uh, SLAM, uh, so uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, so navigation, uh, is improving very much, SLAM is improving very much the energy uh, performance of the, of the system. We can have a gain of a factor two or three between a robot using uh, navigation techniques and the robot moving uh, randomly. And, and this is already something where you can see that the, the SLAM can improve acceptance of robots because it can improve some technical aspect of the, of, of, of the system. But there is something more which is a, a little bit more uh, or less direct than, than, than this, is that we have seen that uh, here you have two, two images. One is a random moving robot doing spirals and, 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 and lines. And the other is a robot using uh, navigation, making a very regular uh, cleaning. Uh, the second one, the regular one, uh, can be much better understood by the user. The user looking at this can understand that the robot is cleaning and can understand how the robot is cleaning. 
In the first case, the, the, the user is a little bit in trouble, cannot understand really what's going on. So SLAM can have an impact not only on the performance, but also on the acceptance by the fact that it's more transparent in the way it's working. And this is very interesting. Uh, uh, is a very interesting impact of some technologies in respect to the acceptance of the people. Uh, I will move to the to the to the ranger. This is the name we gave to this box for the kids. Uh, this box of the ki for, for the kids, we wanted to understand if it is accepted or not, what, what type of, of, of function we can implement on it. Uh, so we made a study uh, of, of analysis of the, of the impact by, uh, you, by bringing this box into 14 families uh, using a wizard of odds experiment. So the robot was remote controlled by somebody who was hidden uh, and, and controlling it through, the, through a hidden uh, camera. And we tested two behaviors, one active and one passive. The active behavior is the robot moving around and trying to point to objects and say, hey, you have to, this, this object is on the ground, what, what, what it makes there, can you, can you put it in, in, in the box? And the passive one is just a robot waiting that the children are putting something inside and then it lights up or makes sound, etc. Uh, these are quite known uh, feedback uh, systems that has, has been already experienced and here we try to experience them in the context of tidying up the room. Uh, the result is this one, so I cannot show you videos because they are quite confidential uh, because there are kids around, but this is the room before and after using the, the, the ranger and of course as soon as the child discovered that he can, putting something inside there is something happening then it starts putting everything inside and, and the, ro the room is cleaned up very quickly. Uh, if we analyze the, this a little bit more in, in detail uh, we can see that both children and parents like very much the, the, the ranger. They find very, very, very appealing the, the, the design is in wood, colors, etc. is something that they like. They would like to have several uh, boxes because with one you cannot tidy up very much. And uh, if we look to the, to the quantitative results, here you have the total number of toys that have been put into the box in respect to, to time. Uh, all experience uh, summed up because we we uh, we don't can, we cannot put 300 objects in one box, uh, and uh, you see that after seven, seven minutes, so all children have started putting uh, object inside, and then they start exploring the fact to put out uh, the, the 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 object, and and then it stabilized a little bit. What is interesting is that the number of object that are put into the, the box or removed is very strongly dependent from the activity of the robot. And surprisingly, for the, the passive uh, behavior is more performant than the active behavior, which means that when the robot is actively pushing the child to do something, the child do less than if the robot is just waiting. Why? Because uh, if the robot is active, then the child doesn't need to do anything to have some fun, and and in the other case, the robot, are, the the, the, child, the, child, the 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 child has really to put something into the box to to get the reward. So uh, small conclusion. So we have an excellent acceptance of this robot, even better than in the Roomba study. In the Roomba study, only three over the nine household decided to keep the Roomba at the end. Here we have a full acceptance. All the family would like to to keep the robot. Uh, we have this interesting uh, aspect about uh, activity of the robot in respect to activity of the child uh, that I, I, I explained to you. And here we have to be careful because the, the, the result that we have can be due to a novelty effect. Uh, so we should see this in the long term if we can keep this interaction with the, with the children. So. Uh, and of course, one box is not the solution for the storage. So we are going toward uh, having several boxes and at the end, integrated them into a, into a, a children's room. Uh, the final goal is we have, we have some vision. I will not explain you uh, all what is on this, on this drawing, but we have some vision about 
how to integrate really robotics in a smooth way into the into the the, the room of, of of child. So as a small conclusion um, for education, I think that I've tried to show you that this this new educational robot where embodiment play a crucial role, and I think that we we, we get there a, a very a very interesting. Uh, uh, impact of embodiment on the learning uh, process. Uh, we have shown that this is age and, 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 and gender neutral. It's an interesting aspect because of the issue of having uh, more uh, girl into technical studies. We distributed now 1,500 of those robots and we are trying to, to see how people use them and how schools try to integrate them in their, in their, uh, in their curriculum. At the level of the, the robotic object that we call Robjects, by the way, uh, I've tried to show you that we can approach radically, in a radically different way, uh, robotics. And there are perhaps other ways to, to, to think about robotics in our daily life. Uh, we made the first iteration where we try to use this, this box into, into homes, and we have interesting feedback from the users. Uh, and we validated the positive attitude, which is, which is a good point, especially in respect to what we saw at the beginning of the skeptical people in respect to, to, to robots for daily life. So this is, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there are some questions, I don't know how you manage the, the interactive aspect of the, of okay. the lecture. OK, yes, we do manage the interactive aspects. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Francesco, for a very inspiring lecture. So do we have questions from the global virtual lecture hall? Is there, or maybe from the local audience here in uh, Madrid? Are there any questions or comments? Yes, there's a question. From? Maybe you can say From Osaka local. University. Okay. Yes. From. OK, well, first of all, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. And uh, well, I was very surprised about the, the results presented in the graph regarding the acceptance of the robots in the different areas. And uh, well, I would like to know your opinion about other types of robots, more in particular human-like robots. You know, here in Osaka University, there's active development of uh, humanoid robots like androids or geminoids, robots that actually look like robots. And some of the professors actually argue that this appearance may actually increase the acceptance of the robots in, in society. So, so I would like to know your, your comments about this. Uh, I think that it would be interesting to, uh, I, don't, I don't think, I don't know if my opinion has some, uh, some importance there, but uh, what, what, yes, what, we, what, we have to, what we have to say is the public, a general public acceptance of this. So what people are ready to, to accept. What, what came out from this survey, this survey is a very serious one, has been done on 26,000 people uh, in Europe uh, in a uh, discussion with the people. So it's not an internet survey or whatever. It's a really serious survey. And what came out is that people uh, tend to, to, to say robots should be used in, in dangerous situation or in rescuing or this type of, of, of situation and not, uh, and they should not be used in situation where it is about care or about children or about education or about uh, social aspects. Okay, this is probably a, a very European uh, uh, opinion. So, uh, it's, it's typical probably from, from, from here. But uh, if you look at this, uh, these two domains, I think that in both domains you can use uh, humanoids. And you can very well, uh, like, like DARPA is pushing now, use humanoid in, in, in rescuing operation because uh, the, the humanoid shape can help in, in solving some task in a very efficient way. So I think that uh, uh, what people here try to, to give as a message is not that humanoid is good or not good. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't care about perhaps the, the, the fact that, that the robot is humanoid or not, but they care about what type of task we will give to the humanoid. And uh, if, uh, if we give to the robot a task of going into the home, then the acceptance 
is a is a key issue, and uh, I'm not sure that the humanoid shape would really help uh, in, in in getting a better acceptance, because right. uh, the humanoid shape will, will will generate a very high expectance from the from the users, and uh, and they already consider very stupid some some cleaning up robots, some some vacuum cleaning robots that do their job. So what okay. they will say about the humanoid, I don't know. Right. Okay. Well, thank you for, for thank you. this uh, question and the reply. So do we have a, we can take another question from the Global Virtual Lecture Hall? Do we have another one? Another question. I mean, I have plenty of questions, but uh, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> okay, any volunteers? A question from Berlin. Okay, excellent. Verena, yes? Uh, yes, my question is, uh, how big actually is the probability in the reality that robots can take jobs away of people because we've seen the survey of uh, what people actually think but what are the real facts behind that okay hmm. good question Francesco so I don't know the the, the, the statistics about uh, about this of course I think that uh, uh, robots can take away jobs uh, but they normally tend to take away the stupid the very stupid jobs, and probably that the workers who had the contact with robots can, can better understand this, can better understand that the danger is not uh, the fact that the, it's, it's not simply that the fact that the, the robots steal jobs, but the fact that the robots will be, will replace just the, the more stupid and tedious uh, work. And, uh, and because of this, probably uh, they, they the fact that the, even those people are confident about this, uh, about the, 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 the trend, uh, let me think that uh, there, is, there is not a big issue at this, at this point. The big issue is the, the image that, that is in the, in, the, in, the, in the general public and not uh, the, 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 the numbers, the real numbers that are behind. In fact, there are, there are quite a number of studies that show that the contrary is actually the case, so that in the long term, uh, jobs are created rather than lost. For example, there are studies demonstrating that the United States, because they were outsourcing uh, labor-intensive tasks to China rather than trying to automate and construct robots in their own countries, lost millions of jobs that they could have maintained had they automated their factories. So I think exactly the opposite is the case. Yeah, and, and in, the, in the survey made by the European Commission, uh, uh, we, there, there was one question. Do you think that the widespread use of robots can boost job opportunity in, in, in Europe? And people who had contact with robots were much more positive on this. So exactly what not, you say. People, not quite people surprisingly, already, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. People, people who saw robots, they believe that this can bring jobs uh, into, into industry. Right. Okay. Well, I think we have to close the uh, discussion here. So thank you again, uh, Francesco, for thank a very, very stimulating lecture. And thanks to the audience for the discussion.